welcome to another episode of the White Sox March to October. And today, today's the big one. It's the special one. It is the start of the 2024 World Series. And you guys have been keeping up. You all saw it in the title. What makes this even more special is it's against the crosstown rival the chicago cubs i really can't believe this happened i can't believe our luck to have gotten such an exciting matchup and like a true rivalry in the world series and also this would probably be like the perfect time to plug the fact that i've been doing a cubs march to october live on stream right here on this channel so if you guys haven't looked into that there's two episodes like four hours worth of content if you want to catch up and if you want to catch it live just make sure you're subscribed to the channel with notifications on and it'll let you know when I go live. But anyway, the matter at hand, the Cubs are the enemy today. So I want to start by doing what I always do and that is take a look at our opponent, scout them a little bit, see what we're going up against. So the Cubs won the NL Central Division with a 90 and 72 record, which is actually the worst record among division winners in the MLB. I'm actually just seeing now they finished with a losing record in division, which is crazy that they still won the division. And they finished the season ranked pretty much right in the middle of the pack, a lot like us, really. 16th ranked overall based on the attributes. Their contact and power is just kind of solid. Their pitching is a little below average, but the defense and speed might make up for that. So taking a look at what they're going to be putting out on the field and at a glance, this is a really solid lineup hitting wise. I mean, their top seven hitters here are all pretty highly rated. And actually, I think I was talking about this in my my last Cubs March to October stream, but I came to the realization, and it's probably way too late to have come to the realization after playing March to October for five years now, six? I don't think the CPU makes trades. Like, I just kind of always assumed they did because we make trades, but I can't think of a single time that we've matched up with a team in the postseason, and they've had somebody on their team that might be like a star player that started the year somewhere else and they traded for him. So I guess just kind of another weird quirk of March to October that I'm not really a fan of. I'd like to see the CPU make trades. But I guess my point is this is pretty much the standard Cubs lineup that you're going to see. And if you have been watching the live Cubs March to October, this is pretty much the lineup that you know from that too. The only real difference being they have Matt Mervis playing first base instead of Michael Bush. But I do want to take a look at the stats throughout the season on some of these players. Nico Horner had a good year. 45 stolen bases over 300 average 46 doubles i'd take that say a suzuki not not all that great actually okay his uh his attributes went down a little bit i would say overall his hitting went down cody bellinger man he did he built on the last season here 30 homer 30 doubles over 300 average yep that's definitely the bat to look out for in this lineup patrick wisdom with all that power 30 homer guy even got that average up over 250 ian happ had a solid looking season i mean pretty similar to what he's been putting up the last few years but one thing i did notice is look at what he has against lefties here. His overall went down, his potential went down, and his attributes against left-handed pitching, wow, what happened? Then you got Dansby, another 20 homer, 20 plus double, almost 30 double guy with a solid average. Christopher Morell, he also was really bad against lefties. Interesting. Still hit 30 four home runs. You got Jan Gomes at catcher, who still has pretty solid attributes. Still a 70 overall, put together an okay season. And then Matt Mervis, their rookie first baseman, plus 10 to that power against lefties, and he didn't play in the regular season. Against lefties, do they have anything changed up? They do, because they have Happ and Morell on the bench. And that brings in, well, this is not very smart CPU. It brings in a lefty Mike Talkman to face lefties. But then it brings in another other lefty in Pete Crow Armstrong but what's really dumb about this is they have him playing DH like this dude's probably got the best fielding an outfielder can have on this squad but to get him in the lineup you, you DH him like what are we doing even though it would hurt me I almost wish I could make this change because this, this just makes me upset I guess it's worth checking into how these guys played Whoa, Mike Talkman with a 328 average, 422 on bait, the 345 slash line, and then PCA, he only played in eight games, so that doesn't really matter. Now onto the pitching side of things, and this does just look the same also in terms of the uh, the rotation here and the bullpen. 
You've got Justin Steele at the top, Hendricks, the only other 80 overall. You got Javier Assad, Tyon. We probably won't see Jordan Wicks. You don't really ever see the fifth starter. And just looking at their stats for the postseason here in the top left, none of these pitchers besides Assad has really put up any good numbers. But Assad only has that 60 stamina, so he's going to be out of the game quick. How about the regular season, though? Steele with a 444 ERA, Hendricks with a 453. 498 for Assad, 486 for Tyon, and 478. That's actually a crazy cluster of all of their starting pitchers being within like a 0.5 ERA. How about the bullpen though? You've got all righties and one lefty that's a 63 overall. So we're pretty much going to be seeing righties out of the pen. And if we see a lefty, it's probably good news because he's not that good. Really their toughest arm in the bullpen is probably the closer but we've faced better closers already in this postseason run and we've handled them so adbert alzali doesn't really worry me too much quick checking in on our roster it doesn't look like the cpu made any changes in between the series same with the pitching yep we're good i did if you forgot i made the change to bench andrew vaughn against righties and start gavin sheets that's probably not going to be taking place today though because we're going to be facing a lefty in game one and then quick checking in on our postseason stats the first thing i want to point out is i kept mentioning how we've been hitting so many home runs and i need to add up the team home runs and see how close we are to like a single postseason record when it comes to team home runs so i've looked into it now we're not really all that close the record is 30 34 from the 2020 Rays. We're at 19, which puts us 15 back, and it did take them 20 games to do it. We're only eight games in, so pace-wise, we're outpacing them. We just might not get to enough games played to actually break that record. But we are having some pretty good postseasons, mainly from these top three home run producers here, Vlad, Luis, Robert, and Eloy. I mean, Eloy's entire postseason production kind of came in one game. He had a three home run game. It got his average all the way up to 333. But yeah, overall, it's these three dudes, really. They all have an over a 1,000 OPS. I wouldn't say the rest of the team isn't contributing. We've definitely had some moments from some different players, like Garver's walk-off home run. Pretty sure Duran's had a couple of good swings. Nicky Lopez had a big double in the last game. Even Ben Intendi, batting 115, he's drawn a lot of key walks. He hit a key home run. The only guy doing absolutely nothing is Andrew Vaughn, and it's crazy because he had such a good regular season for us like this is good numbers and he's 0 for 25 when it comes to pitching we've had a lot of good performances from our pitchers eaters had himself an amazing first postseason and then in the bullpen we've kind of relied on the same arms banks armstrong garrett crochet to finish games and for the most part that formula has been working so i think we're finally ready to get into game one today top of the seventh is where we start with a runner on second two outs from the cubs i really only plan on playing game one today with all the stuff we just did looking over the rosters and all that so it might be a little shorter one gameplay wise it also looked like dylan cease was having quite the start out there he's gone six innings with 13 punch outs it said but i feel like we just got to take in the sights here like we've got the white Sox lined up on one foul line the cubs lined up on the other and it is the world series like when game three starts and we hit the road we're going to be traveling what eight miles up the road like i just just an insane concept to have the cubs and white Sox playing each other in the world series like i don't even know how this would go down if it ever happened in real life would the city just tear itself apart but we do have home field advantage our fans get to see it first and that's probably the most unrealistic part of this game is the stadium is full of Sox fans right now I, that is one thing I feel like I can guarantee if this did happen in real life is this would not feel like a home game for the White Sox the only thing about it that would be the home game is the fact that we're hitting last but you know we're not seeing all those towels we'd be seeing plenty of blue amongst the crowd it would be an uphill battle for our chicago white Sox, but that is one factor we don't have to deal with the crowd is totally on our side i am hyped up man i am so excited to get this started so let's get it started then 80 pitches in for dylan cease oh my god has he even pitched yet look at how much energy he has obviously no reason to feel like i have to take him out now we just got to make sure we don't give up anything to dansby here because there's enough speed on second base that he could score on a on a base hit oh and there we go i did not get that circle change where i wanted it to go but it worked 
And that's what, the 14th punch out for Dylan Cease? And yeah, I mean, our very first look, we get to see Andrew Vaughn once again 0 for 2, but it's because we're facing a lefty. I guess there's not much to look at when it's tied 0-0 with three total hits on the board, but their two hits have come from Suzuki and Hap. Our one hit is from Ben Benintendi. We do have four walks on the board though, and yeah, Dylan Seats, man, he has struck out two batters an inning and he's given up two hits. Ridiculous. We gotta get behind him. We gotta put some runs on the board for Dylan Seats. He can't exit this game with it still being tied. Oh, and I'm early on the fastball. I don't know why I thought he threw it harder. That was only 91. And man, I, hmm, I guess it's not a great swing. You don't want to be on top of the sinker. Moncada, I don't think that's going to get over anybody's head. Man, he just attacked the zone to those three hitters, and I, I didn't make him pay for it. I got to make him pay for that. It stays a pitcher's duel, though. Cease is staying out there. He's got no reason to come out yet. Ooh, good piece of hitting there. 2-2 two -two slider that I did not miss. That was, like, in a perfect spot. Dang, and now they've got some speed on Okay, man, come on. What are we doing, Cease? Why am I missing more spots than I'm hitting right now? Getting a, a lot of yellow releases. I'm gonna risk it. I'm gonna go slider on 3-2. And, I mean, I didn't want to hang it that much, but it worked. Oh, and that might be two. First pitch, double play, grounder to Matt Mervis, and we get out of it. All right, Nicky Lopez, he got things started in our last game against the Yankees. There's no reason he can't get it started now. Oh, and I I feel like Justin Steele just throws that fastball in, like, the weird range of velocity where when you're ready for it, I'm too early. But when I'm not quite ready for the fastball, I'm just a little bit late on it. Like, I can't sit fastball because then that makes me be too early, but I can't sit off speed because, well, first, he's throwing a lot of fastballs, and second, then I'm behind it. Man, Ezekiel Duran's up here getting MVP chance over some of the other players on this team? I don't know. D that had to have been on the swing, right? And I just... I can't be letting him get away with that. That is a hanging, floating circle change right down the middle, and it's just a one-pitch ground out. We've gone eight innings, one hit on the board. We can't all of a sudden transition into the real life offensive white socks from 2024 this year we got to keep up what we've been doing and that you know what that's just a one pitch out nothing to worry about i think duran's gonna handle this too even with a bad jump out there and right and ben and got a great jump on that so he's actually gonna get there I don't know if he gets there without that good of a jump. So if we're going to win today, it's going to be on a walk-off. We may as well do it now rather than later. We've got three monster bats coming up back to back to back. It's Vlad, it's Robert, it's Garver. Only one of them needs to make a good swing. There we go. I'll take it. Get that winning run on first base for free. I'm not going to bother bringing in any speed over there on first because we don't really have much speed on the bench. So 40 speed is it's going to have to be plenty for whatever we do here with Luis Robert. And that's another walk. Back-to-back -back walks, we push the winning run up to second base with nobody out. And if it was almost anybody else right now, I would bunt that winning run over to third. But we don't take the bat out of Mitch Garver's hands. The last time I thought about bunting with him with two out or two on in a walk-off situation, I left the bat in his hands. I didn't bunt with him. He went deep and walked it off. And history repeats itself. The hanging splitter and Mitch Garver with the perfect, perfect to center field. What a way to do it. The first game of the Crosstown World Series is a walk-off to break a 0-0 tie. That completes the complete game shutout for Dylan Cease also. And that's just another home run to our total. Bring it up to 20 now in this playoff run. Man, I just knew it. The more pitches I saw from Mark Leiter Jr. here, the more he kept missing out of the zone. I knew the second I got something to hit, I was going to jump all over it, and I did. 
I did not miss it. And I hadn't really been doing that. I, I saw plenty of pitches to hit throughout this whole game. The couple innings against Steel couldn't do anything. All I needed to do was figure it out for one at bat. We score three runs on two hits and take a one nothing lead in the World Series. I feel like that ending overshadowed what an all-time pitching performance that was too from Dylan Cease. Like that's one that is going to be talked about for decades. In this era, a complete game shutout with 15 strikeouts, and every single one of those outs was crucial. At no point was he pitching with the lead. So now all that's left is to see what our situation in game two is going to be looking like, and this time we got to make a comeback. They're giving us some adversity for maybe the first time in this playoff run, down to nothing. But that is still where I'm going to call it for today. We're going to keep this one a little short. Make sure you let me know that you enjoyed today's episode by hitting that like button. And again, don't forget to subscribe to the channel if you're enjoying this March to October or if you want to see the other side and watch the live Cubs March to October. But guys, thanks for watching another one today. Thanks for stopping by again, and I will see you next time.